So in past videos, we've talked about a variety of solutions for spatial audio, including channel-based, object-based, and amazonics. But what if I told you all of these problems have a major issue, and that issue can be resolved with a technology called wave field synthesis? To explain wave field synthesis, we need to back up and talk about traditional methods for spatializing sound. We'll keep it simple and discuss stereo, which I have a video on if you need a refresher. The short version is stereo sound uses two loudspeakers to represent the location of a sound by playing at different amplitudes and time delays between the two speakers. This method applies to every immersive reproduction format we've discussed so far. They just add more speakers to widen the sound field or improve sound localization. This is really straightforward and works fine. So what's the issue? Well, the big one is that these types of systems rely on the listener sitting in a sweet spot with all of the loudspeakers acoustically equidistant from the listener. As a listener moves outside the sweet spot, certain loudspeakers become more dominant as they get closer and their sound arrives sooner and louder. This causes the sound image to shift unnaturally. For everything from a home theater up to a proper cinema, it isn't practical to fit more than one or two people in the sweet spot, and some people will inevitably have a compromised listening experience. At least that's true for traditional arrays. Enter wave field synthesis. Wave field synthesis is actually nearly as old as stereo sound. Alan Bloomlin published his revolutionary paper on two-channel audio in 1931, and three years later, a paper on a wave field array came out of AT&T's Bell Laboratories. Two researchers, Steinberg and Snow, created a one-dimensional array of microphones spanning the width of a concert hall. They then reproduced the sound from each of those mics on an identical array of loudspeakers spanning the width of a separate space, with each microphone signal routed directly to its equivalent loudspeaker. The idea was that the array of microphones would capture the wave front of the sound, and the loudspeakers would reproduce it, hence the name wave field synthesis. By recreating the physical wave front, you could theoretically get a perfect recreation of the sound image for an entire audience, without certain individuals being outside the sweet spot. Unfortunately, the technology wasn't really practical yet, and that original paper conceded that, for music production at least, two or three channel systems like Bloomlin described were probably adequate. The idea returned in the late 80s, inspired by the seismic measuring technology used to map out oil and gas fields. The basic concept is based on fancy mathematical concepts like the Huygens-Fresnel principle, the Kirchhoff-Helmholtz integral, and the Rayleigh integral. Without getting too lost in the science of acoustics, the core idea is we can perfectly reproduce a sound field by reproducing its wave fronts at other points in space. To emphasize, this means wave field synthesis is holophonic. By synthesizing a wavefront, you can create a sound coming from locations where there is no loudspeaker. A one-dimensional array of speakers can create a two-dimensional sound field, and a two-dimensional array can create a fully 3D sound field. An array of speakers above you can create the illusion of sound coming from right beside you. All that said, there are downsides, which you can probably guess by the fact that Nobody has tried to sell you a wave field synthesis system to install in your living room. An ideal wave field array has an infinite number of speakers that are infinitely small, which obviously is not possible in the real world. Fortunately, we can get the same effect in the audible human range as long as the drivers are close enough to acoustically couple in our hearing range. Acoustic coupling is the core behind true line arrays, which can use that effect to achieve precise coverage patterns with beam forming, but we're concerned with using the effect for sound spatialization instead. Math tells us that the drivers need to be within half a wavelength to couple. So with six inch drivers, the highest frequency you can properly reproduce without aliasing is about 2000 Hertz, which if you've watched my video on stereo sound, you'll know is not great. A 4-inch driver gets up above 3000 Hz, but at that point you're starting to seriously limit the bass response of the array. 
Although there is always the option of supplementing an array with a separate woofer array or with subwoofers. Aliasing distortion can also happen at lower frequencies when the wavefronts are arriving at a steeper angle relative to the array, which limits where you can spatialize sounds within an array. Fortunately, in practice, the aliasing problem is not as dramatic as you might think, and there is also the option of combining wave field synthesis with more traditional sound reproduction techniques. That said, even with 4-inch drivers, you would still need about 400 of them to cover a 10 square foot area, and each of those drivers needs to be individually addressable as well, which means 400 amp channels and 400 outputs from your playback device, at least for a two-dimensional array. A one-dimensional array in the same space would only require 30 loudspeakers and amplifier channels, but even the best Dolby Atmos home theater systems utilize only 16 channels and are fully 3D. This isn't the end of the issues either. Reflections caused by room acoustics can disrupt the wave fronts, meaning you need a fairly anechoic environment for best results. You can also get what is known as truncation artifacts when listening close to the edge of an array. With all these downsides, you might wonder why I even bothered to make a video on this technique, as it's clearly impractical for any real-world scenario. And the worst part is I haven't even touched on all the potential issues, and we've only gotten into the acoustic reproduction challenges. Recording and mixing for wave field synthesis is its own can of worms. Fortunately, there are a handful of real-world applications for wave field synthesis. There are a number of wave field systems in museums, exhibitions, and even traveling theatrical shows. One example is the sonic chandelier at the Casa del Sueno in Italy. The Sphere in Las Vegas also has a sound system that's capable of wave field techniques. These installations are able to overcome a lot of the issues by working with the technical limitations creatively, or by using a hybrid approach that combines wave field synthesis with other techniques. There's also a lot of research being done on wave field synthesis in universities and laboratories to utilize computer processing and psychoacoustic tricks to overcome some of the problems. And considering wave field synthesis has only been seriously discussed for the last 25 years or so, I think there's a lot of possibility. After all, even stereo systems rely on a lot of trickery to achieve their full potential. And as development continues and computers become more powerful, wave field synthesis might even become practical enough for your home theater. If you're watching this from the future, and that's the case, let me know down in the comments. Also, let me know if you'd like me to explore wave field recording and mixing in a future video. But anyway, that is it for this video. If you like this video, hit the like button. If not, feel free to hit the dislike button. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave those down in the comment section down below. As always, if you want to see more videos like this one, definitely hit that subscribe button.